I recently watched the first 1960 debate between Richard Nixon and JFK, and I wanted to give some thoughts on that. Now, for background, this is one of the first big, big televised debates, as opposed to a radio-only debate in a presidential election. Now, the reason this mattered is it's pretty standard that people who go on TV wear makeup, both men and women. Wearing makeup just to make sure the cameras don't get an unflattering image of you. Now, the story as I heard it goes that Nixon, when they asked him if he wanted to wear makeup, he said no to this, I don't need it. Whereas JFK, when they asked him about makeup, he said sure, why not? And because of this, as the story goes, people who listened to the debate on the radio said that Richard Nixon won, and people who saw the debate on TV said that JFK won. Now, when I rewatched it, I was only half watching. I would say I only actually watched around 10-15% of it with my eyes, as opposed to just listening to it. Because I listened to a lot of things just at work while doing other things with my hands and just listening with an earpiece. But even that 10-15% that I saw, I would agree that someone who watched it would come away thinking Nixon did worse, and someone who listened to it would come away thinking Nixon did better. I don't think that that's because of the makeup, though. I think that's because of Nixon's facial expressions. Something else that politicians really, really think about when they're giving TV appearances today is what their face looks like. You have to have a smile, you have to give the right facial expression at the right time. Trump is very good at this, but then if you look at Joe Biden's appearances at different points during his presidency, you can see him gradually go down and as he loses his ability to speak publicly like he used to, his ability to maintain his facial expressions, until we get to the 2024 debate when it was just a disaster for Biden. But back to the 1960 debate, Kennedy came off as being a lot more collected, a lot more confident if you look at his face, and then Nixon, there are times when he just looked uncomfortable looked like he had a toothache or something. Those are the times when Kennedy is speaking when the camera's on Nixon's face. The term resting bitch face comes to mind, honestly. But then if you listen to it, there are subtle hints, even if you listen to it, subtle hints of Nixon being on the defensive rather than throwing jabs back at Kennedy. He's more defending his policy and saying, hey, I'm not that bad. But then the moments that I did watch it, it came across as Nixon feeling a lot more flat-footed than he sounded. So that is an interesting thing to think about when we look at this debate. Now, onto their actual policy. JFK, in a few different places, he took the position of the federal government needing to be the ones to solve people's problems, and notably, he did actually directly praise both Wilson and FDR when he talked about the kind of America that he envisioned. Whereas Nixon, on the other hand, I, I know that Goldwater isn't a good comparison. I think Goldwater would have been considered a lot more fringe and further right, but when you compare both Nixon and Goldwater together against JFK, you see they both seem pretty libertarian. Nixon had his libertarian moment in this debate. Uh, paraphrasing a quote from him, government shouldn't spend money that a man can better spend himself. That's something that I've heard even today. I remember a story about the government, a, a local city or town government or something, quoting thousands of dollars to build a set of stairs in some park somewhere, but then a local man spent a hundred dollars at the local home improvement store and he built the stairs himself, but then some local ordinance made it so that the stairs that the man cheaply and goodly built had to be taken down anyway. That's the thing that comes to mind when I I hear the kind of policy that Nixon, as opposed to JFK, envisions. And back to that argument that the individual citizen can spend their money better than the government, that argument can be used on healthcare, it can be used on car insurance, you can sort of stretch it to use it on school choice. There's a lot of places where that argument, that mentality can be used. Another place where this comes into play is they spent a lot of time during this debate talking about a bill that, I was unfamiliar with it before watching the debate, but the bill apparently, from what I heard during the debate, would have, at the federal level, increased teachers' salaries. And the candidates went back and forth talking about it, but they were trying to catch Nixon in a trap that, basically, oh, you said you wanted teachers to have higher salaries, but you voted no to this bill. Why did you do that? Nixon, at the time being vice president, therefore he has a vote in the Senate. And the answer Nixon gave was along the lines of the federal government shouldn't be allowed to legislate things that have to do with education. If you look at the 1787 Constitution, that is the Constitution of the United States of America, education and schooling is not a power that is granted to the federal government, it is something that's overseen by the states. But one last thing that stood out to me, something I want to comment on, it struck me 
the emphasis that was put on the national debt, which, yeah, we talk about the national debt so much today, and of course it's ballooned into being at least one order of magnitude bigger than it was back then. But back then, people understood it more. There was this understanding that if you want to pay for big government policies, you need to either print money, which causes inflation, or you need to raise taxes. And the way that the candidates talked about this, you could tell easily that the voters understood this on a base level, that most most voters don't understand it today. I think the issue has become abstract because we've had so much time, so many decades of politicians talking about this. We've talked it to death basically to the point where voters no longer care about it, and that's a problem because it is something to worry about. We have runaway inflation currently, it's causing a lot of problems, and it's compounding other problems that were already there and not completely related to the government out of control printing money. And now my ultimate takeaway from this debate, what I knew about Nixon and Kennedy before watching this was certainly not enough. My impression of Kennedy was, of course, the assassination, and of course the fact that he was the golden boy of Massachusetts, but also the impression I had of him before this was that quote about him wanting to reduce the CIA or disband the CIA or something like that, and also a debate that I've seen tossed around now and then about how much involvement he really had in getting us started in Vietnam and getting us sort of taking the first steps down that slippery slope towards the massive amount of involvement that we had that ultimately became a huge foreign policy failure, spanning multiple presidents, but arguably beginning under JFK. But then my impressions of Nixon before this debate, for the most part, all I knew about him was Watergate. But I also was aware that the 1972 election map was a thing, Nixon winning every single state in the Union except D.C. and Massachusetts, giving rise to a joke that I like to tell a lot about Massachusetts going Democrat even if Kennedy ran as a Republican. Or there, there's variations on that joke. Even if Jesus came back and ran as a Republican, even if Kennedy's ghost ran as Republican, something like that. Craft that joke to your own whims. And then, of course, the other thing that I knew about Nixon was Watergate. But now, of course, I have at least a new appreciation for the values that I have in common with Nixon. JFK, though, in contrast, it goes all the way back to the founding of the government in its current form, the first few presidential administrations. We literally had a Federalist Party, meaning more federal power, as opposed to a Democratic Republican Party, meaning meaning Democratic Republic, something that favors rural farmers, something that the government has a lot of roadblocks to overcome if they want to get anything done. And even before that, we had the Articles of Confederation. This country spent nearly a decade under a system of government that quite obviously would not work because we just hated central authority that much, these being the same people that started a rebellion against King George. And even before that, centuries before that, thousands of years in fact before that, Sargon recently, a couple weeks ago, put out a video contrasting Plato's Republic with Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and demonstrating how those differing ideas for the spirit behind how a government and a society should be run, should be set up. Those two polar opposites, big central government, small central government, are still very much at war today. We see it now with the neoconservative and neoliberal establishment. Neocons and neolibs have teamed up to stop the populists, to stop the loosely organized collection of strong individuals fighting for liberty as opposed to the highly organized collection of weak individuals fighting for big government. But I think I have rambled enough about this one debate. I will leave you to leave some comments.